This is Technically Legal, a podcast about legal technology, innovation in the legal industry, and the impact tech is having on the law. I'm Chad Main, the founder of legal services company Percipient. And on today's show, I'm talking to Adam Kovakovich. Adam and I are talking about the FTC's widely anticipated lawsuit against Amazon. Today's show is squarely focused on the impact tech is having on the law. I have a conversation with Adam Kovakovich. He's the founder and CEO of the Chamber of Progress. This is a group that describes itself as a new tech industry coalition devoted to a progressive society, economy, workforce, and consumer climate. The organization gets behind public policies that it believes will build a fairer, more inclusive country in which the most people possible benefit from technological advancements. The Chamber of Progress has some clout. In fact, the New York Times describes it as one of the most powerful tech lobby groups. Adam and I have an in-depth discussion about the United States Federal Trade Commission's recent efforts to address what it believes to be any competitive activity by large tech companies. Most recently, the FTC set its sights on Amazon. And by the time you're listening to this, if the FTC already hasn't sued Amazon to rein in what it perceives to be anti-competitive power, most expect that a lawsuit's coming very soon. However, not everybody agrees with the FTC's take on Amazon and the big tech companies. Adam and the Chamber of Progress believe that the FTC's change in philosophy under its current chairperson, Lena Khan, might also actually harm consumers and stifle innovation in the tech industry. Under Chairperson Khan, the FTC's focus is less on the impact a company's market power has on the consumer vis-a-vis pricing and more on the structural market power that tech companies have over their respective industries. As we will hear, one of the reasons Adam founded the Chamber of Progress is because he has deep experience in tech industry policymaking and politics. In fact, politics has been in his blood basically since he was a kid. Prior to founding the chamber, Adam worked at Google for many years as the senior director for the company's U.S. policy strategy. After Google, he took a similar role at Lime, that's the e-bike and scooter company. And before that, right out of college, Adam was a staffer for his local congressman and ultimately handled press duties for Senator Joe Lieberman. I say Adam has been politically minded since he was a kid because although his dad made wine, he opted not to follow in his family footsteps and headed to Harvard to get a degree in government. But while at Harvard, he got his first taste of politics and drew upon his roots at the same time. I did not have the farming genes. That is not one of my talents. I worked in a kind of a clerical job uh, on the family farm in my summers in high school. But the biggest contribution I probably made to kind of the farming industry was in college, I led a campaign to bring grapes back to the dining halls at Harvard. And uh, that was probably the closest I got to the the actual, you know, business of doing it. But that was using my talents as a as an advocate. They were banned because of labor issues. Is that correct? So Harvard had, this was in the mid nineties, had at that point been observing what was a a pretty old grape boycott from the the United Farm Workers Union. Although to be honest, by that point, even the United Farm Workers Union had really kind of deprioritized the the grape boycott. So it was somewhat odd that Harvard was still observing it officially. I don't even know that the dining hall administration realized that they were. (laughs) And they announced they were bringing back grapes and it became a big controversy on campus because some groups started opposing that. And, you know, I I had observed campus politics and was a bit of a contrarian. And I thought, well, you know, no one ever forms an organization on the other side of this debate. And so I got together with some friends and we formed the Grape Coalition, which was the pro-grape side of the debate. And (laughs) it ended up being a whole big debate on campus to pro and con we negotiated over the terms of the election. There were debates and there were editorials in the student newspaper. There was, you know, I, I actually um, called up the trade association for the grape industry and they sent 15 boxes of grapes to my dorm room to give away on campus. <laughs> and it was a big deal. And, yeah. um, and and so eventually we had the vote and we won and grapes came back. And then the next year, I think it was Yale or Stanford voted and they brought grapes back. And then the, the year after that, the United you know, Farm Workers Union announced they were done with the boycott entirely. So. So that was kind of fun. You got this political bug in college. And right out of college, if if I'm understanding your background correctly, you do get into, you become a legislative aide and spokesperson. That's right. Was that always what you planned to do? Or did you have another career path you were thinking about? Well, I started working for my congressman. um, It was a guy named Cal Dooley for representing Central California, basically after my freshman year in college. And I kind of got the political bug. I was always interested in politics. But it was interesting because he was a founder of what was called the New Democrats in Congress, who were the pro-tech, pro-growth, pro-business Democrats. So that was very much how I identified. So I think that was a really formative experience. 
But then, like I said, this experience kind of doing this campaign to bring back grapes in the dining hall kind of solidified that I liked um, being an advocate and a campaigner to achieve a kind of goal like that. And then ultimately, you start working for Senator Lieberman as a spokesperson. Was that the best use of your skill sets? That where you gravitated? Why weren't you just, you know, being a congressional aide, do, you know, doing research about bills or dealing with constituents? How did you land in this kind of spokesperson PR type of role? Well, I was always interested in policy, but I was also very interested in kind of persuasion and sort of how you communicate about a policy topic, how you simplify it, how you explain the stakes. You know, I think some policy ideas have sort of a superficial appeal when you first describe them. But then when you really look at the stakes of them and, and think about the consequences, they might have less appeal. And that was interesting to me. And so I think it was kind of melding together all of those things that I enjoyed doing. After D.C., you feel some more roles in PR and, and doing the spokesperson type of thing, but it was more in the private sector, right? You were working with trade groups and specific industries to on press there? Yeah, that's right. And, and I had been working on the campaign, some campaigns in 2004. It was a bad year for Democrats who I was working for. Both of them lost. And uh, I came back and, and I was looking for, uh, you know, something else. And, and there was an opportunity to be spokesperson in one of the tech industry trade associations group called ITI. And that was a lot of fun. And then after about two years of doing that and similar work, I ended up at Google and Google's Washington offices was really getting off the ground. So I was basically about the seventh or eighth employee of Google's Washington office. And uh, this was 2007. So it was pretty early in the company's early. kind of life cycle. Yeah. And it was, so, it was sort of interesting to kind of help shape the company's approach to Washington. But also, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't long before the company was being kind of had a little bit of a target on its back from governments, from other companies. And so I helped to kind of shape the, how the company would approach that as well, including the area of antitrust. And what were you hired to do in 2007? To be the company's spokesperson in Washington on policy and regulatory issues. And then my, my role kind of morphed over time into kind of a campaigning role and, and a strategy role. How much of your time was spent in that role actually going to the Hill or talking to- Not very much. Not elected for officials and versus vis-a-vis -vis talking to the press? Hardly any, to be honest. Right. We, had, we had other I had colleagues whose job was to lobby Congress. That wasn't my job. So mostly it was talking to the press. And then later it became like, so when Google started facing antitrust issues for really the first time in its history, which was really 2007, it had just acquired YouTube. That was a uh, acquisition. I think it was a $1.5 million acquisition, which is kind of amazing <laughs> how small that was in, yeah. in hindsight. Yeah. But then um, that had gone through and then uh, Google acquired DoubleClick on the adver digital advertising side. And that became kind of the first acquisition the company had done that had controversy associated with it and started bringing out other companies, Microsoft, AT&T, some of the privacy groups to criticize the acquisition. And Google at that point hadn't really had that experience or an acquisition for it, didn't have to kind of campaign to close a deal from the regulatory standpoint. And that was an interesting challenge from my perspective that I just sort of dove into. After Google, you go to Lime. Are you working in a similar role? Yeah, I had been at Google for 12 years, um, which was a great time. So the company grew a lot and had a lot of interesting policy challenges that I worked on. And then in 2019, I went to Lime, which is one of the companies that provides these shared electric scooters in cities around the country. Totally different kind of challenge where when you're at Google, mostly you're trying to prevent the government from doing bad things to the company. When you're at a company like Lime, what you're really working on when you're in government relations is market access. You're trying to get cities to give you permission to deploy your scooters on the streets of their city. So you're really kind of trying to get permits and, and win permission. And that was just a really different kind of experience. And, and it was all purely at the city, almost, almost exclusive at the city level, which I, was, I had focused on Congress. So just as an advocate, it was a chance to try to do something completely different. And then you could really kind of do something as rare in government relations, which is tie your work to the, the success of the company. I knew that really? if I got 500 more scooters in Cleveland, it would mean this much more revenue for the right. company. That's interesting. That, because Google, you're kind of fending them off, but here that's you're right. opening doors. That's, that's interesting. It's interesting. That's right. So after Lime, I think it's 2020 or 2021, Chamber of Progress is founded. Yeah, you that's right. You take your skills and found Chamber of Progress. Tell us about that. What is it? So Chamber of Progress, I launched in uh, the spring of 2021. We are a tech industry association, so we're 501c6, but with a center-left bent. And this is a little bit unusual, but the reason why I was motivated to do that is because, again, as somebody who kind of, my formative experience was being part of the New Democrats, the pro-tech Democrats, for years it felt like Democrats really viewed 
tech is kind of their industry, right? Barack Obama, sort of proud, you know, techie, right? Uh Trekked out to the Google headquarters and was pretty visible and comfortable with the tech. A lot of people from tech worked for him. What I started noticing really around 2016, around the time that Trump got elected, was some Democratic policymakers in both federal and state level started taking a more negative posture towards tech as an industry. And to some degree, I understand that because Democrats always have a concern about power, particularly corporate power, and tech had gone from being maybe a little bit like cute and cuddly to being, you know, among the most powerful companies in the country and in the economy. So that makes makes a lot of sense. But it struck me that some policymakers, particularly Democrats, were rushing to regulate the companies in ways that were kind of at odds with their own voters' feelings. There was a big debate in California about gig work. We had the legislature, right. Democratic legislature, reclassify gig workers as employees. When that same question was put to the, the voters of California, again, this is a blue state, they voted to respect gig drivers' independence and, and their status as independent contractors. And yet, you know, these voters were also electing those same representatives. So there's something that was kind of amiss here. And I was interested in sort of closing that gap because I generally believe that, you know, many Democratic voters were pretty happy with the tech industry and tech services, felt like they liked the value they could provide in their lives. And also that, you know, they'd love to see kind of more tech jobs and opportunity come their way. And so it was worth having a debate among Democrats within the Democratic side about where to go forward on tech regulation. So that's really our mission. We only focus on the debate on Democratic policymakers and um, sort of found premise on the belief that technology has been a net positive for a lot of traditional progressive goals, getting more goods to people, more information, lowering the cost of goods, and more services to people. All those things have been true. Technology, it's not assured that our technology will continue to do those things, but generally speaking, it has. And so we should sort of focus on how do we sort of maximize the good of technology and of course, cabin and and try to prevent the bad. Now, you said you focus on Democratic lawmakers. Is that because on the other side of the aisle, they're generally more pro-business and less, maybe less hostile to tech? Well, it's interesting. The normal alliances have really been completely altered where, you know, I think right. historically you had a general sense that like Republicans were the party of business and Democrats were the party of anti-business or labor. Wow. I just think that's in some ways the the exact inverse right now. Like, I mean, I really think like if you look at a lot of companies, they are based in big cities. They have big, diverse workforces. Those cities are generally Democratic. A lot of executives are Democrats. A lot of companies are very committed to uh, principles of inclusion and diversity. Business, in some ways, I sort of feel like Republicans liked business when business was on their side and voted solidly Republican. But of course, you know, the last couple of years, you've seen more and more Republicans kind of say, well, you know, it's not too much that we love companies. We liked them when they were agreeing with us, right? But I think that Trump took the party in less of a free market, free enterprise direction, more in kind of a populist MAGA direction, where it's less about companies are not seen as part of that. I think that actually, in some ways, people at companies are kind of up for grabs politically. And frankly, a lot of them are Democrats. And they don't like everything the Democrats do, but certainly agree on a lot of social issues, even redistribution, taxation issues maybe don't love all parts of the Democrats' regulatory agenda, but agree on a lot of on a lot of the core issues. So we're going to talk about Amazon and antitrust specifically here in just a second. But before we get there, tell us about some other initiatives and some other things the Chamber of Progress is working on, other companies and other tech issues that are on the radar. So I think we really work in three big categories. So the first category I call technology policy. So for us, that's antitrust, privacy, online speech issues, content moderation, some of the big issues that you see a lot in the news affecting Amazon, Google, Facebook, Apple. A second category for us is what we call civic innovation. So that's really technology services that sort of are more connected to your experience in a community. So for example, delivery services like Uber Eats and DoorDash and Grubhub, gig work, autonomous vehicles, which of course, you know, I think are expanding in a number of cities across the country, home sharing, peer-to-peer car sharing, things like that, sort of these innovative services and this sort of sharing economy. And then the last big area is financial policy, where we focus a lot on both crypto, digital assets, as well as fintech policy. So those are our three big areas. And then we also speak up on social issues. So we've spoken up on voting rights. We've spoken up on LGBTQ issues, especially when we've sort of seen policymakers, particularly in states and in red states, go after companies on those issues. When we come back... Adam gets into the nitty-gritty of the FTC's current battle with Amazon. 
I'm Chad Main, and you're listening to Technically Legal. This podcast is brought to you by Percipient, a legal services company powered by technology. Percipient helps legal teams tackle legal operations, electronic document review, and process automation. Percipient services include managed document review, subpoena compliance, cyber incident response, and also helps legal teams provide clients with process-driven legal support. To learn more, visit percipient.co. Percipient. Legal services powered by technology. We're going to get back to my conversation with Adam Kavakovich about the FTC and Amazon in just a second. But before we do, I want to direct you to tlpodcast.com. There you'll find an episode page about this episode and every episode we've done in the past. On those pages, you'll find links to more information about our guests and some of the stuff we talk about. All right, let's get back to my conversation with Adam Kavakovich, the CEO of the Chamber of Progress. I think in some ways this goes back to the thing that probably first put Lena Khan on the radar, policymakers and, and legal scholars, which was in 2017, six years ago now, she wrote a paper about, I think it was called Amazon's antitrust paradox. And it was generally focused on this idea that maybe Amazon's behavior doesn't violate the traditional way in which the antitrust laws have been applied, particularly since much of it is has a clear pro-consumer justification, but... Lower prices, access and lower, lower prices. prices in particular. Yeah, lower prices in particular. But that she argued that it had, some of their practices had a negative impact on suppliers, on sellers, and on, and on competitors, and that antitrust law ought to be expanded to consider those impacts more holistically, which of course is, you know, is a departure from, from antitrust law generally. Generally, antitrust law has been focused on stimulating competition, not protecting competitors. And but this was, you know, very much of concern. And again, she sort of viewed Amazon as sort of like the main company that she was concerned about. Through the years, she, you know, she then worked on the Hill and she worked on a big report on big tech and included many of the same points about Amazon, as well as about Google and uh, Microsoft and uh, Apple and Facebook. And, you know, she's been the chair of the FTC for the last two years. And the FTC has actually had two cases, one of which is still opening on Meta, a company formerly known as Facebook and antitrust. But last year, she directed the FTC to devote more resources to investigating Amazon. And there have been now several reports over the last couple of months about what they've been looking at. And they had a closed commissioner meeting about two weeks ago. We don't know for sure what it was about, but there's a very high likelihood it happened to vote on a complaint against Amazon. And I think they're very likely to bring that complaint publicly after Labor Day. You said something there that she said that the, the kind of FTC's current MO and Lena kind of specifically in reference to her note was kind of expand the government's reach with antitrust. But she would argue, she's just going back to the roots of the Sherman Act. You know, it's the Sherman Act wasn't there necessarily to make sure that consumers had the lowest price. It was to make sure that there was diversity in the marketplace and you just didn't have one person controlling everything. That definitely is, I think, is what she would argue. And, and certainly her argument and, and some of her allies' arguments are that she's going back to what she believes is the original intent of the Sherman Act and the competition laws, more so than kind of the way the law has developed with things like the consumer welfare standard over the last, you know, 30, 40 years. And so I, I agree with you. I think that that is part of her argument. So it's in some ways, though, it's kind of expressly rejecting the precedent that's been set over the last 30, 40 years in antitrust law in favor of a, of a different vision, what some people call sort of a neo-Brandeisian vision. So your concern is that if the FTC prevails or more regulations hammer companies like Amazon, that tech companies, it'll be harder for them to innovate. So why do you think that? Because just when I think about it, I would think, well, maybe if you just have one company trying to control the market, maybe they're not as motivated to innovate because they've got the market. So what about this kind of regulation would stifle innovation from others? Yeah, I think actually my argument is a little bit different in the case of Amazon, which is that I think that the aspects that the FTC seems to be looking at it as likely to sue Amazon over are really mostly about Amazon Prime. Prime. And Amazon Prime is something that customers really love. They love the two-day shipping. They love the discounts. They love the convenience. They love all the other perks that they get as part of that. And so I guess, you know, in this case, part of my argument here is that in a place where most consumers see something great, 
chairwoman Khan sees something nefarious. And not only that, you know, is if the lawsuit is successful, she would make Prime much less useful for consumers and probably make Amazon itself as a service work less well for consumers. And so it's not so much about innovation per se. I think in this case, it's pretty narrowly tailored to, you know, what is the problem here that she's trying to fix? I, I don't think she's had masses of Prime customers writing to her saying that they don't love Prime or they're really upset with Prime. So my argument is a little bit different that I just, I find this a very strange area for her and the agency to focus on given with her very high rates of satisfaction with Amazon Prime. Yeah, that's an interesting point because I think I saw it was your organization that did a, a study and it's like high 80% like Amazon or their Amazon Prime. Yeah. People in the government are there to serve the populace and the, the constituents and stuff. I know it's an administrative agency, not elected official, but still at what point does the actual desires and the benefit of the consumer come into play here? You know, that's, a, that's an interesting yeah. point that everybody's happy. I think that's right. And I, but I do think there's a little bit of a, you know, she staked a lot reputationally on going after Amazon and were she not to then do anything, bring a case against Amazon, it might, you know, in her mind, or at least her supporters' mind seem a little bit odd, but I agree with you. I mean, so for example, there was an interesting um, moment a couple of months ago where the FTC was asked to spend more time studying the electric utility industry, the power industry, to see whether companies have engaged in monopolistic pricing or, you know, have basically been kind of screwing customers in terms of how much power costs, right? And I think you can look at that and you say, that would have made a lot of sense, right? That'd be, that would make a lot of sense for the FTC to look at. But Khan actually told Congress, who had inquired about this, that the FTC didn't have the resources to do it. Of course, they've used resources on things like this investigation against Amazon. They've used resources litigating against Facebook for this virtual reality deal that they lost. And so they've used resources on other things. The, re the resources are, are finite, so they have to make certain choices. And I just, I think she's pursued cases that are much less about pocketbook impact to consumers than instead about sort of advancing some kind of ideological or even academic agenda. That's an interesting request of her because to your point right there, her argument is, look, low prices aren't the be-all end-all. But in her note, she ends up saying you got two options here, right? In her, in her opinion, you can either proactively try to rein in tech before it becomes a problem, or you regulate it like a common carrier or a, or a, a utility. So that's interesting that they didn't want to do that because maybe it supports that argument, right? Like, Hey, you know, you, you know why prices are low? Because we do, we, it's a public utility that we regulate. Yeah, I think in some ways it's it's sort of a mix of arguments. So, for example, this lawsuit that she brought against Facebook's acquisition of a company called Within, which is a virtual reality company, was meant to block that acquisition. And Facebook's argument was that in that market, which was uh, a virtual reality connected fitness apps, it was a really young market, right? Right. And by the way, might not even ultimately be a successful product category that it just seemed kind of silly that the FTC was arguing that, that this deal was going to monopolize the space. Is there anything to monopolize? And is the market so small that it's so insignificant? So I think that's at odds with her argument that like you, you have to kind of nip consolidation in the bud as soon as possible. I also think there's a little bit of like just sort of revisionist history. So for example, you know, Google acquired YouTube for, I think it was for $1.5 billion, maybe it's maybe it's $3 billion. Anyway, a relatively low amount. It wasn't a foretold thing that that acquisition would be successful, right? A lot of acquisitions, I worked on a lot of acquisitions at Google, were not successful. They were not successfully integrated into the company. They didn't become successful products. Same thing with Facebook's acquisition of, of Instagram and WhatsApp. They were successful and credit to Facebook for doing, for integrating them successfully, but it wasn't a foreground conclusion that that was going to happen. And so in some ways, this lawsuit that she's filed against Facebook in particular, which is going on for a couple of years now, is trying to penalize the company for integrating an acquisition too well. And that just seems not quite right. There's an interesting point raised in, in these arguments too about how you should look at the structure of a, of a market, not just the consumer impact. But one of the arguments, I'll paraphrase, but that it's harder for smaller entrants to come in because the big guys have so much data and so much power. What about that, though? What about the fact that Google has so much information on us? I'm a Google guy. They, they know everything that I do. 
or Amazon, you know, I'm a big Amazon guy too. I, I use yep. them to buy everything and they know. So what about that? I mean, what, you know, the little guy, like if you and I decide to start a business that sells shower curtain rings, you know, we have to go to Amazon marketplace. We're starting blind, you know, but Amazon has all the information. Yep. What about that argument? Well, I think that for any new business, there are definitely going to be some barriers to entry. And so to pretend that otherwise is not, you know, not, not realistic. If you're a brand new company, for example, you're going to have to spend a good amount of your budget on marketing, just making the customer aware. And so you're going to have to raise that money for marketing awareness before you have any revenue. And that's just going to be part of your business plan. I think it depends. If you're going to start a new general purpose search engine to compete with Google tomorrow, it better have something really different and unique and amazing because otherwise I don't think the world is going to care, right? That you don't have right. a right to compete. You don't have a right to take market share from Google if your service is not contributing anything. So there was a company called Neva, which has complained about Google in the antitrust realm after giving it a go for several years. They were bought earlier this year and kind of folded. But their model was they were going to be ad free and charge users $5 a month for their service. And I think ultimately that was not a winning business proposition. There were not enough people who were so bothered by ads that they were willing to pay $5 a month for something they can get on Google, you know, for free. And so is that Google's fault that Neva didn't do anything differentiating? I think a contrast is, you know, last fall or December when OpenAI opened up public access to chat GPT, it scared Google because right. people, you know, when they use it, they're like, well, I'm getting this amazing, you know, answer that d doesn't require me to like hunt and peck around the, the internet for my answer. And it should scare Google. And by the way, Google's sort of caught up with that and now it's doing its own thing. And that's wonderful. I think that's great. But the ability of, of chat GPT to um, succeed was because it was doing something completely different than what Google was doing in Google search. So that makes a lot of sense. Right. But wouldn't they say to you too, well, that, Adam, that's, that's, about 90% true, but OpenAI had a lot of deep pockets, including Microsoft. They were coming yeah. in with a little bit of an edge. Of course. But I mean, that's kind of my earlier point. Like, I, I don't think we don't have a business or product environment where you have a right to get in front of a prospective customer for free or a government granted right to do it. You have to attract investment. You have to go out and market yourself. Like, you have to do these things. And so I think the thing that the government looks for in antitrust is whether there's some kind of structural lock-in. That's the key. So is there some kind of thing that's really, you know, contractually binding a consumer to use Google, right? When I worked at Google, we'd say competition is one click away. I mean, again, chat GPT showed up, people could try it and they weren't locked into Google. You can extract your data from a lot of these services, bring them over to a new service. So that's what the antitrust enforcers usually look for with sort of these structural barriers. That raises another interesting point. You just said when you work at Google, the mantra was competitions one click away. This is what kind of caught me as interesting when I was preparing for the podcast today. So the way tech companies, the big tech companies win is their moat. Like they just dominate the market. That really, except for Standard Oil maybe, that really didn't happen back in the day that much. So like the whole business dynamic has changed. So is that a good or bad thing that basically to win whatever race we're in, AI or search for Google or sale, you know, online seller for Amazon, is that a problem that generally to win, you need one company is going to win? Well, I think every, you know, you're right. Every business is seeking a moat and uh, that doesn't mean the moat has to be anti-competitive. Should it achieve your moat through legitimate means and preserve it through legitimate means by always winning through quality, like not locking consumers in artificially or preventing them from leaving. And so I think that's like a challenge. One of the things I see is particularly among the big four companies, Google, Amazon, Apple, Meta, to some extent Microsoft too, they're all pretty paranoid <laughs> in a, a competitively paranoid, which is to say they don't want to get left out of the hot new thing. And if they see somebody else succeeding in something, they're going to try to get in it. I think that's great. Sometimes people decry that as a bad thing. I think of that as a positive thing. It means that they're not resting on their laurels. If they had a true monopoly, they could rest on their laurels. That's that's really kind of like the structural definition of a monopoly that they could not innovate and preserve all of their customers. But I think their paranoia in adopting new things, even making acquisitions, and that is frankly because they see that consumers are fickle and there's always a chance that something new and better is going to come along. And so 
better to disrupt yourself before you get disrupted by an, by somebody else. But isn't that one of Khan's arguments too? That like specifically going back to Amazon, it was I think it was the diapers, or there was a company that was selling diapers in the mail, and a lot of that was done on Amazon. Amazon shut them out, ends up buying them. So wouldn't that be an argument yeah. against your position? Like, well, they're using this structural power to ice out these innovative companies. If you go back to the report that she wrote as a staffer for the congressional committee, I'm I'm almost positive that they mentioned the diapers dot com acquisition as an example of this. I think at the time, it was certainly true that if you look at the market for diapers, if you combined Amazon's share and diapers.com share, I'm almost positive that was a below 50%. So a lot of people buying diapers at the grocery store, at Walmart, at Target, right? So people kind of forget that sometimes. I think, too, along these lines, is you, it's your position that if you come down hard and regulate Amazon, you're actually going to hurt the smaller guys. The people that sell people, the stuff in the marketplace, and you're going to kind of stifle consumer options and access to those goods. I think there's an interesting tension at the heart of Amazon's business, right? Which is that, you know, I think people don't realize this. Like, there are some products that, if you go on Amazon.com, and there's some products that Amazon sells directly, but a lot of sales on Amazon are through what they call their marketplace, which is to say, it's really a seller having Amazon handle the fulfillment and sale and sale of that good. And it's very interesting because, you know, I think that when you have a business like that, an e-commerce platform like that, where you're sort of, you're providing visibility for marketplace sellers, you have a lot of consumers. Some people call a three-sided market because you've got the platform, you've got the seller, you've got the consumer, right? And you really need to keep all of them happy. They've also have advertisers. But at the end of the day, if you lose the customer, the rest of it falls apart. And so sometimes, for example, and, and this is one of the issues, but likely in the FTC case, sellers are competing to be placed in what's called the buy box, which is essentially when you go and click buy now, the seller that gets the privileged position. And Amazon is going to try to privilege the seller who has the best deal and the highest reviews. And all of that makes perfect sense, right? But of course, some sellers don't get that position and complain and don't like it. And so they complain about Amazon's rules for how they pick the seller in the buy box. So each individual seller might not like specific things that Amazon does. But the reality is that if Amazon were to degrade its rules for picking a seller to be in the buy box, that would hurt consumers and would also hurt all sellers. Because all sellers benefit from the quality of the Amazon marketplace being high such that it's drawing in consumers, right? Amazon has its own value proposition to consumers that is different, you know. So, so it's just a point of saying like, yeah, like actually there's going to be times where Amazon makes decisions that se individual sellers don't like. But so long as they're ensuring the integrity of the overall marketplace, that benefits sellers ultimately. Going back to the FTC and their strategy of going to court and they admittedly don't care if they win or lose they've lost they've lost some bit the big stuff they've lost to microsoft the, the microsoft activision deal they lost the meta slash facebook deal that we talked about with the vr two questions for you there number one at some point doesn't the results be damned kind of position doesn't that turn negative on them because they're setting court precedent but then question number two is, I think their position would be, their argument would be, well, it's not even an argument, they've said this on the record, that they want to influence Congress to change things. So number yes. one is, don't you think it hurts on the precedent level? Number two, do you really think it's going to entice Congress to change these laws? I think it's a mix of what I call YOLO, you only live one strategy, but also a little bit of a martyrdom strategy. Historically, the FTC has been more selective about bringing cases, and it would pursue a lot of settlements and consent decrees with companies. That also had a deterrent effect on companies. Khan's view and the view of her allies is that that essentially was too conciliatory, that previous Democratic FTCs were too conciliatory, and they accepted too many compromises around the scope of the FTC's authority, and that the only way you expand the FTC's authority is bring these bold cases and win. So far, the bold cases she's brought have lost, and I think, frankly, this Amazon case, as it's been reported, will also lose. But this case won't see the inside of a courtroom for two to three years. Khan may be long gone by then. 
she'll get some headlines from bringing this case and perhaps doesn't have to own the consequences of a loss because she can say, well, look, I tried and the courts, you know, were, were stacked against me and they were too conservative and in their, their traditional approach. But there's an alternate path, which is really to pursue different cases, pursue better cases that I think are more clearly going after harms to consumers. What's a good example there? Hospital mergers, food mergers. There are a lot of examples of horizontal mergers that are increasing Horizontal prices. meaning the same. Two companies in the same space. Competitors. Yeah, two companies in the same space. There's a grocery merger before them right now. I think the, the, the case for those things will increase prices for consumers is much greater than what she's gone after vertical mergers. Like the uh, meta virtual reality case was a vertical merger, meaning that they were not in the same space. They were not in the same product space, but they were sort of at different layers. And those are much harder cases to win. You just raised an interesting point there too. You said that they don't settle. They just sue results be damned. And in other, I, I saw an interview with you on Bloomberg. You, you noted there that many of these companies, many of these tech companies have settled with the EU, like people, uh, com- countries in the EU and other regulatory bodies. At some level, that kind of goes against her argument in the note, because at the end of the note, like I said, she she says two things. You can either regulate them like a common carrier or a public good, or you could try to, you know, put in some laws to try to, to nip this stuff in the bud, because wouldn't a settlement be just that? I mean, you, you've got the, the tech company coming to the table and is going to give the FTC something instead of get 100% of this deal they were working on, they're going to get 75 or whatever. So isn't that the same result? Yeah, in fact, there's one likely aspect of this case that I think will illustrate that, which is that this link between Amazon Prime and what's called fulfillment by Amazon, which is if right today, if a product is labeled as Prime, a Prime eligible product in Amazon, it is almost certainly shipped through what's called fulfillment by Amazon, which is to say that, you know, let's say you run a a silverware company and you want to sell through Amazon. Well, fulfillment by Amazon means you send your stock of silverware to an Amazon warehouse. They fulfill the order. They ensure that it meets the two-day shipping guarantee. They handle all that. And you pay Amazon a fee, a commission for using fulfillment by Amazon. Some sellers have complained about that. They say, well, we want to be labeled as prime, but we don't want to use fulfillment by Amazon. And in fact, Amazon for years has had a program called Seller Fulfilled Prime which would let a product still be labeled as prime, but let the seller use their own means of shipping. One of the problems they encountered with this program is that there was no quality controls. And so, you know, consumers would buy good and they would say, oh, well, this is prime. And then if the seller was using seller fulfilled prime, it wasn't getting there in two days. So they, Amazon wasn't making good on its promise. But last year, the European Union struck a settlement deal with Amazon on this point. And they essentially agreed that the solution was that sellers should be allowed to use seller fulfilled prime, but that Amazon can enforce certain standards that sellers meet and through the seller fulfilled prime program. That to me is a really good balance of, okay, give a seller another means of getting this good there, but also ensure pretty high customer service standards so that Amazon continue to make good on the sort of the value of Amazon Prime. They came to a pretty good accommodation there. If Lena Khan wanted to, she could probably sit down with Amazon and say, we're interested in the same kind of arrangement here in the United States. Let's deal. Let's let's work out settlement. But she hasn't. And I don't think she will. That's not her style. So it strikes me as kind of wasteful that you have a situation like that where there's an issue that they've identified that the even the Europeans who are not seen as reasonable usually settled on, and yet she seems poised to litigate instead. How do you protect against this? One of the arguments, even back in the day, in support of antitrust laws was you don't want a company, you just don't want a monarch to run an industry, be subject to the king, because not only they have power, they have the money, and then they can start controlling government and who's elected and that. So how do you prevent against that in this day and age where, you know, like we talked about, a lot of tech companies, they that's the market. There's just one person because they win the moat. How do you protect the electorate and the, the citizens of a country from one company or many companies controlling their elected officials? In terms of kind of political 
political influence, things like that? Yeah, political influence, campaign. You know, yeah. Obviously, if your company has more money to donate to a political candidate than maybe someone else that I want to elect as an individual. Yeah. Well, it's funny because I see a lot of political scrutiny of big tech. They're all big political donors, too. But I don't think their political donations are sparing them any political or regulatory scrutiny. And by the way, it shouldn't. It really shouldn't. You're a big, powerful company, a lot of influence on the economy and this in society. You absolutely deserve scrutiny. And so that comes with the territory. The distinction I would draw is what is the problem you're trying to solve and what is the solution? And does the solution make things better or does it make things worse? And I think right now, particularly with respect to big tech, we have a lot of politicians who sort of, you know, they're bad and powerful. And so therefore we should do X. And X is a really sweeping response as opposed to kind of a narrowly tailored intervention. And so I think we are headed hopefully towards a more productive moment where we regulate tech like we regulate other industries, which is to say we focus narrowly on the problem to be solved and don't try to do everything with the regulation. Adam, I appreciate your time. If people want to get a hold of you or learn more about the Chamber of Progress, where should they go? I'm on Twitter at Adam Kovac. And Chamber of Progress is online at progresschamber.org. Okay, that's a wrap for today's episode. As always, we really appreciate you listening. If you want to subscribe, you can find us on most major podcast platforms like Apple, Spotify, Google, Stitcher, etc., Also, if you like us enough, I hope you leave us a favorable review. Thanks again for listening. Until next time, this has been Technically Legal.